Yeah, welcome to another session of the grammatical theory lecture. Today we will deal with lexical functional grammar, LFG. Um, this is where we are in the uh, lecture series. We already covered government and binding, generalist phrase structure grammar. And last time we introduced feature description, feature structures. And today we will uh, deal with the first theory um, that makes use of that, um, lexical functional grammar. And then we will uh, later talk about a driven phrase structure grammar and tree joining grammar uh, that also make, make use of um, feature descriptions and feature structures. The reading material is chapter seven of the grammar theory textbook again without the section on semantics. Um, this semantics is actually interesting in uh, LFG, but um, that, that would be too much to cover in the one semester course we are doing here. Okay, um, lexical functional grammar was developed by John Bresnan and John Kaplan in the 80s. And it's an instance of uh, so-called West Coast linguistics. Um, John Bresnan uh, and Ivan Sark both graduated from MIT. Uh, they did their PhD with Chomsky and the MIT is uh, at the East Coast and um, Palo Alto and Stanford where um, John Bresnan and Ivan Sark went to uh, are located in the Bay Area in California at the West Coast. So that is as far as one can get in the US. And um, yeah, there, there are reasons, not just uh, as far as the series go, um, but other reasons as well. A apart from LFG and HPHG, there's also construction grammar, uh, which was done in Berkeley by Fillmore and Kay, and that's uh, right around the corner. It's also Bay Area. Um, so that's West Coast linguistics. Okay, so LFG was, uh, had the aim to be um, psycholinguistically um, plausible. And um, it was also, there were also uh, computational implementations right from the beginning. So. Uh, Ron Kaplan um, did most of the implementation work. So he had a, a group at Xerox, uh, Xerox Park. Uh, you, you know them maybe from copying machines and, and stuff like that. But they also had a, a very good linguistics uh, group, computational linguistics group. They did morphology there and, and LFG parsing. And so that was uh, Ron Kaplan's part uh, in, in this uh, dream team. And um, John Bresnan was the conceptual head of uh, the linguistic theory. There is teaching material, um, a good book by John Bresnan. Um, that was, I think the first edition was 2001 or something. And there was a second updated uh, edition by her and co-authors. Um, and uh, there's another textbook by another important researcher in LFG, Mary Dalrymple. And um, this chapter here um, is, or the book chapter and this lecture uh, is based on uh, an overview chapter by Mary Dalrymple. Um, at least as far as the English material is concerned. Uh, of course, we are talking about German and um, th that was not from that paper, but is um, coming from Judith Beermann, Judith Beermann's work um, on German. So important works here, larger works are by Judith Beermann and by Philipp Bakuk. Okay. As Usually we have a general set, a section on uh, with general remarks on the representational format. Um, LFG has multiple levels of representation. So first there is a C structure. 
um, C structure stands for constituent structure, and it's basically phrase structure rules um, often adhering to the XPA schema. So when we are looking at, at English, uh, as you know from the introduction, uh, XPA structures make perfect sense. But um, LFG also had a strong typological um, focus. Uh, and, and they looked at Australian languages and they are not like English at all. So they, they are uh, languages like Valpiri where you can uh, have, where you have a rather free order of constituents. And um, LFG has a very cool rule saying uh, a sentence consists of some constituents, any amount as, as you want. Um, that, that is very strange for people who really who were brought up in the phrase structure tradition um, but it actually works and we will see um, reflexes of this or of the general architecture in the uh, grammar of german um, and we will you will be able to understand why it also works for for valpiri and uh, uh, languages with even more uh, was even freer constituent structure or constituent order. Um, apart from C structure, there's F structure, the so-called functional structure, and um, there are mappings relating C and F structure. We will see what that is and what it means in, in a minute. Um, so yeah, so what is F structure? LFG has um, grammatical functions like subject and object uh, as a very important part of the theory. So they are primitives of the theory. So, so you can read uh, in, in theoretical statements, uh, subject and object. That it's not, that this is not the case in, in the other series we talk about in this, uh, uh, lecture maybe in in construction grammar there there will be uh, things like subject and object in the theory but um, in GPSG uh, government and binding uh, HPSG and so on there is not uh, people don't talk about subject and object uh, in in GB it's sometimes uh, said okay there is a subject position so that's a specifier of ip right um, but it's not um, something that is part in in, in trees or in, in constraints and descriptions but in lfg these grammatical functions are uh, part of the theory and you see an example for that in uh, 156b so that's the so-called F structure for the sentence here, David devoured a sandwich. And um, we have uh, uh, a pret value. So all lexical items have a, uh, a pret value I mean, of, of the main categories, nouns, verbs, and adjectives. And um, so they are highlighted here. And we also have um, pret values for, for um, the subject and the object, right? So this is the, basically the, the predicate as we would have it in, in school grammar. Uh, devoured has some pred feature and then the um, uh, subject and object has a pred uh, feature as well. Okay, the, the pred feature is, it looks a little bit like semantics, but it isn't. It's uh, basically, uh, uh, something like subcategorization, uh, like a valence frames. So you have the pred value here, and then it, then you say, okay, devour uh, needs a subject and an object, right? So that's some selectional feature. You you can use that for semantics. So there are mapping from this to semantics as well, and um, but that's uh, not the main purpose of of this structure. Okay, so what kind of grammatical functions are assumed? So if, if you have that in the theory, then it's really important that um, you know what kind of grammatical functions you want to have and also how to determine them. And that's sort of funny because um, in introductory courses, 
um, there is usually a lot of discussion uh, what a subject is and uh, what an object is and so on. And that's sometimes not easy, but uh, for LFG, it's crucial. So they have to uh, be clear what a subject is. Otherwise they, they cannot write down their theories. Okay, so they have a grammatical function for subjects. Okay, that's a subject. Um, for objects, um, th that's the, basically the accusative object, the direct objects. And then there uh, is one for uh, comp, the sentential complements. And um, they have a, a further uh, grammatical function called object theta. Um, that's a secondary object. Um, so this is basically the, the object that is affected in, in passive, the accusative object in languages uh, who have it, or which have it, uh, which have accusative and, and respective case, so the primary object, so to say. And uh, this is a secondary object, object theta, and theta is some theta rule, so in English it would be object theme. Then uh, there is some grammatical function for oblique arguments. Um, so that's usually at positions, like uh, prepositional objects in, in German. And it also comes with a grammatical, uh, with, a, with a semantic role, um, like goal or uh, agent, oblique agent would be a by phrase in English in passive constructions or a font pp in, in German. Um, so what we just saw were the governable grammatical functions. So that is stuff that appears in Pratt values, but then there are also so-called non-governable uh, grammatical functions. Um, and examples are edge for adjuncts and topic and focus uh, uh, for the topic and the focus of an utterance. Uh, that's so-called discourse functions. And we will return to that in uh, towards the end of the lecture or this session, uh, because we need that for fronting in English and German. Okay, um, the, I said there is a mapping between the C structure and the F structure. And in order to say something about this mapping, we have to uh, use functional descriptions. And um, this is one, uh, functional description. So we would say something um, about the, the tense value in a certain functional structure f. Um, we can uh, assign that um, feature a value with respect to this um, uh, functional structure and can say in f the tense value is passed. And um, the value of a feature may also be uh, another F structure. So that may be complex, um, th this type of structure. And uh, what this says is that the subject of a uh, functional structure is G. So that could be another complex structure. So to give you an example, that uh, what you see here is a description of the F structure that is connected to um, the utterance David sneezed. So what it says is that the Pratt value of a certain F structure is sneeze subject, the tense value of this structure is passed, uh, the subject value of this uh, structure is G, and G again has a, is a, is a structure and uh, the Pratt value of G is David. So this, this basically describes this uh, F structure. And that's what we want, right? So we want to attach this descriptions like this to lexical items and to uh, C structure rules, and then build these uh, F structures from that. So, what you see here in B is a mapping, uh, a mapping from C structure to F structure. And um, it basically says, okay, the 
the NP here is this, right? So that this is phi is this uh, mapping mapping function, and uh, you can map this NP node to uh, the value of such, right? And we will see how to to write that down in a minute. Um, if you look at these uh, uh, structures, then there are certain things to observe. A phrase and a hat uh, always correspond to the same F structure. We will see how to write that down in, in a minute. And um, this means that IP, I, I bar and I are always mapped to the same F structure and VP and all the levels below that are mapped to the same F structure as well. Um, This, this is what, what I just said, that a head and, uh, uh, and the dominating phrase of projection of the head always point to the same F structure. So that's what you see here. And uh, this is a more complex example where you have uh, IP, I bar and uh, I and also uh, the the VP node, so that's all uh, projected to the same F structure. Um, what you see here is what I also said in in earlier uh, lectures, earlier sessions. The, um, the LFG for for English also assumes. Um, X bar theory. So these um, structures probably look familiar to you from the X bar session and the GB session we had. Okay, what kind of constraints are there on these uh, uh, structures, on the F structures? Um, there are two important constraints, and um, one is completeness that says that uh, whatever appears in uh, pred values um, has to be in the F structure. If you look at an F structure and there's a pred value in it uh, saying, I want to have a subject and an object, and there's only a subject but no object, then that um, F structure is not well formed, it's not complete. Um, the, the other uh, thing that corresponds to or the opposite uh, kind of constraint is coherence. So if you have uh, a predicate requiring a subject and an object, and there is something in addition in that F structure, then that is wrong as well. So here you would have a sentence like David devoured a sandwich that Peter sleeps. And of course this that clause is too much. It's not appropriate for this kind of sentence with, with a verb devour. And this is um, what it would contribute to the F structure, right? It would contribute a, a comp uh, feature with a certain value, sleep uh, Peter. And that's not correct. So um, this F structure is not well formed and the sentence is ruled out by that. But that basically is the coherence and completeness uh, uh, constraints is basically the theta criterion of um, um, government and binding. So all uh, arguments uh, of uh, an, an element have to get a thematic role and there may not be anything in an argument position that uh, doesn't have a, a thematic role. So all thematic rules have to be assigned, but there must not be anything in addition. And that's the same here with coherence and completeness. Okay, so how can we formulate these restrictions on the C structure? Um, this is the first annotated phrase structure rule we see, the uh, first C structure rule. Um, there, there are these uh, funny arrows here, up and down. And uh, what, this, what this says is, 
um, this error, I'm referring to the F structure of the mother, and this says I'm referring to my own F structure, so ev to everything that is below that node. And uh, these, if you see that uh, up equals down, um, then that means um, that this is the head, basically. It, it says that this node and this node point to the same F structure. So this is uh, the, the lexical item in this case, it, and you point down. So whatever I contribute is this one, right? And then you say, okay, and, and this is the same as the, the mother is pointing to. So this V bar points to the same thing as well. And then you get this, this type of tree we already saw for David is yawning, where you have a lot of things pointing to the same F structure. Um, here we have a V bar rule with an object. And again, we have the up equals down. So that's basically the verb pointing to this thing and the V bar pointing to this thing. And then we have something new and now it's, it's important that we understand what is going on here. It says, okay, this thing that is below that, so everything that, that uh, belongs to that NP is identical with the value of the object in the upstairs uh, F structure. So it points up, right, to, to this uh, uh, F structure that this item is pointing to, the, this is this one, and talks about the object and says, okay, um, my stuff, so the stuff of the NP, uh, is the value of this object thing. Okay, if th that's, crucial and maybe not that simple. So you have to watch that part of the presentation again if, if, you, uh, if it was too fast for you or stop it and think about it. Um, um, yeah, so th there's some written text that basically corresponds to what I just explained. Think about it. This is a lexical item uh, that works similarly. Uh, you say um, the structure of the mother uh, has a tense value and tense value is passed and the pred value is sneeze and uh, subject, right? So that's the presentation of uh, sneezed. Now let's look at uh, the first phenomena. The first thing to look at uh, is passive. And here we have some, some interesting basic assumption uh, that then also uh, influences the, the way passive and also other things like resultative constructions have to be analyzed. So the basic assumption uh, that is made explicitly in uh, uh, LFG and also in uh, HPSG and other uh, uh, frameworks is that uh, we have lexical integrity. That means that words are atoms of syntactic structure. I think that's what most of you learned in your Linguistics 101 class, um, that we have phonology, morphology, syntax, semantics, and uh, morphology deals with uh, words, how they put together, how they are put together, and then we have syntax that puts the word to words together and uh, semantics tells us what all of that means and so on. Um, there are theories, including government and binding, uh, who have affixes or even, um, even all of morphology in, in the syntax. And um, there are other uh, theories that uh, assume that morphology is uh, crucially different from syntax, so that there are different rule systems, that there are things that are possible that are not possible in syntax. And uh, they also believe that uh, syntactic 
rules uh, cannot create new words and they cannot look inside uh, the structure of words. So they cannot see that there is a prefix. So, so let's say um, I'm a verb and I want to uh, select uh, uh, a noun phrase with a noun that has a certain prefix or something. That, that is not possible. And um, Bresnan and McTrombo uh, wrote a long paper discussing these issues and what is possible and what is not possible. And um, uh, so that's assumed for LFG that words are basically atoms of uh, syntax. If you look at trees, then that means that every terminal node, so that's what at the very, what's at the very bottom of uh, syntactic trees is uh, a word. And um, this means that certain analyses are just not possible with an LFG. So one thing I want to show you um, that is ruled out by, by principle is the analysis of uh, Pollock uh, of, of this French uh, sentence. Um, it has a negation, this uh, distributed negation of, of uh, or split negation that consists of two parts in French and um, some morphological affixes um, to, to the yeah, what else? Morpho some affixes to, to the verb. So the analysis uh, suggested by Pollock is shown here. So he says, um, we have a VP with a verbal stem here with the uh, subject inside of the VP. Um, and then we have uh, in the T, so that's I in, in our uh, setting, um, in the inflectional head, um, tense head in, in more recent versions. Um, we have the ER, uh, this conditional, and then there is a negation head uh, with a NE, and PA is, uh, on top of that and in, in the specifier of the negation. And then there is some agreement uh, ahead here with the agreement ending uh, third singular. And the analysis works like this, that the PAR uh, moves to the 10 set, then uh, moves on to the negation head and together with the the ni, which is then something like a prefix or whatever, forms a unit uh, with, with a pa, uh, moves in front of the, the agreement ending. And then Mary moves to agreement, uh, to the specifier of agreement phrase. Um, so that's very complicated and to me, it's totally unclear why one would want to have such an analysis. Um, it's not related to psycholinguistic evidence. So why, why should there be these transformations? It's totally unclear. Um, I think these, these things develop from developments of frameworks uh, that, that assume these kind of transformations and then uh, people do things to them, but there is no uh, external theory, external motivation for this kind of transformation. Uh, on the contrary, uh, if you look at psycholinguistic uh, evidence, then there seem to be other structures pre preferred. Of course, you may come up with certain explanations why that uh, uh, how, how that m might be processed, but it's, uh, you make it much more difficult for you if you assume that this sort of has some psycholinguistic reality. Okay. Um, so, so that is ruled out and um, 
but what we want to look at, and that's the reason why I uh, discussed it uh, in the first place, is um, the, the passive. And what John Bresnan observed is that the, uh, the adjectival participles that can be used pre-nominally have the same form of the passive uh, verbs, right? So um, she has uh, the examples in 174, a well-written novel, uh, a recently given talk, my broken heart, an uninhabited island, split wood, right? So, and do you see that um, the, the form of the participle is always the form that you have, uh, the, the verbal form, right? Write, written, give, given, break, broken, inhabit, inhabited, a split, split. And here you see it's prefixed by un, the, the adjectival uh, prefix, and um, this only uh, attaches to adjectives. So there, there is a version of un that also uh, attaches to, um, uh, to verbs like unzip or undo or something, but that has a different meaning from, uh, un, uh, from this one. And um, so, so you see, okay, um, this has to be an adjective because um, the, it, it uh, has this adjectival behavior. You can uh, attach things here. Um, it does things that uh, adjective, adjectives do. It appears here in front of the noun. And, but it always has the form of the uh, verbal participle. And um, what, what, what is important is that the, the um, argument structure of these uh, pre-nominal uh, participles is like, uh, or like, like the valence or selection of properties is like uh, that of adjectives, right? So uh, if you have the, the verb break, I can broke my heart, my heart is broken, uh, my broken heart. So, so what you have here is something that predicates over the object uh, of the adjective, uh, of, of the active uh, form, right? So here you would have an Eike, uh, and uh, that would be the object. The passive form is with heart as subject and the um, participle uh, as if used as an adjectival uh, participle uh, predicates over uh, the object like, like in the passive, right? Um, so the, the passive item here, um, has only the the object as a subject, and this is the same here. So the adjectival participle predicates over this element, and um, the the B example here is parallel to a copula uh, sentence, um, a predicate with a predicate adjective. My friend is smart. My smart friend. Um, so here. Again, this is a passive uh, construction. We are predicating over the, uh, the now subject af after passivization. And uh, this is a corresponding adjectival use. And it's completely parallel here to the adjective. Now, um, the, the point is that um, there, there are adjectival participles in uh, which is shown here in these examples and they have the completely the same form as um, these um, uh, passive participles and if you would want to assume that this and and they also have the same selectional properties right as is shown here and if you would assume that this sort of happens in a syntax then the the um, connection wouldn't be explained, right? So it would not be explained why that's always the same form, why this is the, basically the passive form with passive valence as well. So um, 
Bresnan concludes that uh, adjectives have to be derived in the lexicon. Um, and uh, if the verbal passive were not a lexical process, that would be rather strange. Um, so one, because we know that the passive has to be a lexical process because there is prefixation and so on that's going on in the lexicon, in the morphology component before syntax. So um, the, the passive has to be um, a, a lexical process too. So that's a, a classical level ordering argument and it's very important to to understand how it works. Uh, the same argument was also used for re uh, resultative constructions. Okay, um, how does it work, the passive as a lexical process? Um, we have grammatical functions as primitives of our theory. Um, so we don't have three positions like spec IP or something like that. We just have subject and object as, as real uh, terminology in our theory. And um, the words determine grammatical functions of their arguments. So in the lexical item, we say we need a subject and an object. So um, if we want to do passive, it's sort of straightforward. We can just say, okay, suppress the subject. That's what we want to do. We already talked about that uh, in the GPSG lecture. Um, LFG assumes that there is a hierarchy of grammatical functions. So subject, object, object, uh, theta, oblique, and so on. And um, when uh, a participle is formed in morphology, the, the passive participle, then the highest argument is suppressed. That's a subject, so um, that's exactly what we want uh, as, with respect to, um, to passive. The next highest argument is not realized as object, but as subject. And how all that works is uh, uh, described in lexical mapping theory. So that's a part of the theory that basically uses features to uh, encode um, properties of, of um, grammatical functions, of arguments with respect to grammatical functions. And then it's determined whether a certain argument uh, is a subject or object. It's not that clear uh, how that works. There are many or several versions of this and um, the papers are often saying, but look for this language you need it to be that way. So um, that is sort of, well, a, a bit frightening, right? So we will not discuss it here. There is one version of lexical mapping theory that works for German that is discussed in the book. Uh, we will not discuss it here. Um, but there is um, earlier work um, by, by Jean Bresnan about passive where she does not refer to the lexical mapping theory, but gives a passive uh, lexical rule um, that is rather simple. It, it uh, does the mapping directly. So it says, okay, um, if there is a subject, um, uh, this uh, is mapped to nothing, or to oblique, so that would be the by phrase in, in English or the von pp in German. Um, or, uh, and if there's an object, an object, then it's mapped to subject, right? So that's uh, two things uh, we want uh, to say about uh, the passive. So a subject uh, is suppressed, and if there's an object, it goes to a subject. Um, yeah, the next phenomenon we want to look at is the verb position. Um, there are two options that one can find in the literature. The first one is that uh, uh, researchers assumed the verb final trace. So that's basically the analogon to the uh, GB analysis with a verb movement account that was uh, suggested by Choi in a CSLI publications book 
and um, Berman uh, discuss it as well. And there's another uh, approach uh, assuming so-called extended head domains uh, that was suggested by Judith Berman in, also in a CSLI book uh, in 2003. And that's much more interesting if we want to compare theories because that's something new. And it's, I think it's pretty unique to, to LFG. At least it's a very interesting way to deal with um, such things. So let's uh, look at these extended head, head domains. Um, the the rule in 197 shows you um, a, a, a VP rule that says um, a VP can consist of uh, arbitrarily many NPs and uh, a V. And the, the V is in brackets, which means it's optional. The Klini star, um, the, the star behind the symbol means that uh, zero or any number of repetitions of this symbol can be used. So that's, that means also that this NP is basically optional or there can be several of it. Um, the, the assumption of the extended head domain analysis is that the verb can also be in the C position and it just contributes its F structure constraints from there. And this is the, the cool thing about the analysis because in the end, it's important what is in the F structures and that, they, that there is a Pratt value and that everything that is uh, in the Pratt value is also, uh, that is selected basically by the Pratt is also there in the F structure. It doesn't matter if this F structure is coming from uh, from from the C position or from the uh, from anywhere else, right? So so this is very interesting, and you have to understand it because otherwise you think an optional V. What kind of VP is that, right? So there is no no V in the VP. Hmm, strange. So uh, what about headedness, right? So there should be uh, some head somewhere, but it's uh, possible in LFG to say well. It's optional. It will work out in the end of the day. Let's see. It matters that everything is there in the end. Uh, I don't care who, who brings the cake for the party, right? Um, okay, so let's look at an example. So that would be uh, Verschlinkt David den Apfel, uh, Devours David the Apple. And we have this rather funny VP here, consisting of a subject and an object. So this is a preliminary structure, right? We, did, we didn't deal with reordering. Now we will revise how it works. But this is the VP consisting of as many NPs as we want and an optional V. And in this case, there is no V because it's optional. It's okay if it is not there. But there's um, uh, the subject. And this uh, constraint says, okay, what is here goes inside the upper uh, F structure and is the value of the subject of this upper F structure, right? So up and subject is what is below here. So this is the subject of something. And um, since this is the same as its mother, and this is the same as its mother. All these point to the same uh, F structure here. So that was the subject. The same is true for object. So it says the upstairs F structure and the object of this is identical to uh, the what is below here. So the apple goes here because this points there and the object of this is this right okay so ah and and i almost forgot the c so this is uh, the verb it's in the c position and it says okay my f structure constraints are contributed here and this uh, verschlingen devours uh, 
contributes the pred value saying I want to have a subject and an object and all of this is here so fine right okay um, so that that was um, verb position and passive is already dealt with and now we have to talk about local reordering so uh, again, there are two options. The first option is that we have uh, traces. So we have a base configuration, we have traces, and then we have movement. Um, that's also like the scrambling analysis in uh, GB, suggested by Werner Frey. But um, we already said that we don't like, or <laughs> I, I said I don't like it. Um, there are reasons for not assuming the um, the scrambling analysis, scrambling as movement. Um, you can either watch the, the GB session or read it up in the textbook. It has to do with reconstruction of uh, quantifier scope, so that makes uh, wrong predictions. But there's a, a different, uh, uh, suggestion by uh, Judith Beermann, um, where she says, okay, it's just licensed directly in phrase structure rules in the C structure component. And this is how it works. Um, the base generation approach, um, the verb Verschlingen has a pred value. It says, okay, I need a subject and an object. And it also says that the subject uh, case value is nominative and the object case value is accusative. That's not surprising, but it's a lexical specification of these uh, case values. Now, if we remember how GPSG did uh, valence and phrase structure rules, the approach by Uskorite basically said, okay, all arguments are uh, depending on on one verb, so they had a uh, was quite had a v three uh, rule saying verb v three goes to verb and then np 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 or whatever how how many nps you you needed. Now the <laughs> the fun thing is that the rule for uh, for vps in lfg is uh, a vp goes to an optional v. So that's even more bizarre than what we saw, right? So it's, it, it doesn't even have, have to have the V. So then there's nothing, but there should be some arguments in a VP, right? But um, the, the purpose of that rule is just, uh, it's not to license arguments, it's just to, to start recursion basically. And uh, you, there are further rules um, that add, uh, NPs. So again, this is a lexical item, right, with uh, selecting a subject and an object. Then we have this rule starting the recursion, and this is um, uh, the rule that uh, adds a subject and uh, object or object uh, theta. So you have VP here and you have VP here. So by using that rule, you just uh, license another VP and you can do that as often as you want. And uh, in the end, all the grammatical functions that are required by um, the verb have to be there, right? So you have to have a subject, you have to have an object and you are not allowed by this particular word verb to have an object theta. So that's basically, if you remember uh, the very first phrase structure trees we saw, uh, we had a, a binary branching and a flat one and I asked which one is the better one. Uh, and this basically gives you the binary branching trees and you could in principle, if you just look at the uh, phrase structure component, you could go on forever, right? But there are further constraints saying you have to have a subject, you have to have an object and nothing, nothing more. So that gives you the right kind of trees. This rule just introduces NP arguments. Of course, you need other rules for PPs or for sentential arguments. Now, 
let's look at the order. So that this would be an uh, example analysis uh, with uh, nominative before accusative. You have um, the subject here and the object. And this is this funny rule with, uh, that starts the recursion, right? So you have the verb, uh, that rule license a VP, the head and the mother are mapped to the same F structure. Then you have a rule combining a VP and an object uh, to form a new VP. The object is added to, to the F structure here. And then you have the subject again, combining a VP and a subject uh, to form a new VP, right? Okay, so that was nominative accusative. And then I go forward, you will see there is minimal change in the slide. Um, now we have uh, den Apfel David verschlingt and we again, v, VP start the recursion here. Um, then we combine the subject with a VP rather than the object. And then in a second step, the object uh, and the VP, object VP to uh, form a new VP. But again, the same F structure results and uh, uh, we just have a different order. Okay, of course, uh, you may wonder about quantifier scope and so on. There is uh, another structure uh, referring back to, to linear order and uh, predicate argument structure. So, so there is something would be here, right, to um, get the semantics from uh, this kind of complex representation. Now the last thing we want to look at uh, is uh, long distance dependencies. And um, again, there is a new thing, a new kind of tool uh, that was suggested in LFG. So it's interesting. And the first thing we have to look at is uh, discourse functions. So um, the the we, we look at long distance dependencies in, in English first. So an example is given 185. Uh, Chris, we think that David saw. So this Chris here is the object of David and it's not in the position where it should be, right? So that, that's where you usually put objects in English, but it's here at the very beginning. So that um, Chris here has two functions. Uh, first, the argument function here, it's the object of saw. And then it has a, an, an additional uh, function, a discourse function. Uh, it's a topic of the whole clause um, of the matrix clause. Um, there, uh, you may wonder what what is, uh, contained in these F structures. So is it arbitrary stuff or, uh, you know, in, in terms of these functions? But um, the point is that there are so-called, that the topic and focus are so-called grammaticalized discourse functions because um, they go together with certain syntactic configurations. And therefore, um, they, they are introduced in these F structures so that there can be a syntax uh, a discourse function correspondence. Um, the topic and focus are not lexically subcategorized and are therefore not uh, uh, subject to co completeness and coherence. So they are not part of Pratt values. Right. So in the beginning, when we talked about grammatical functions, we talked about governable, governable and non-governable uh, grammatical functions and topic and focus are not uh, in, selected in Redens frames in these Pratt values. Um, they, in, when, when we look at the F structure, the topic and focus are not just thrown in somewhere at an arbitrary place, but they are uh, connected to 
uh, some element that bears an argument function. So um, because of coherence and uh, 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 completeness, all the uh, grammatical functions, the, the, the governmental grammatical functions that appear there have to appear somewhere in a pred value and um, nothing more is allowed. But then there are these um, uh, discourse functions and they are just connected to uh, one of the uh, argument functions. We will look at uh, an example on, on this slide. Um, so this is the first uh, thing we want to look at. Chris, we think that David saw. And uh, what you see here is that um, the, uh, the Chris here is topic. So there is a topic uh, feature and the value is the Pred Chris thing, uh, feature structure. And this um, item here is uh, connected to the object slot in the comp slot. So we have, uh, oops, sorry. We have a, a comp feature that corresponds to that David saw, to, to the that clause. And as you see, there's a um, C uh, predicate here. And, um, uh, the object of, of this C clause is uh, missing, of that, that clause is missing, and it's uh, identified with a topic that is uh, in fronted position. Um, this, this identity can be written down as a, a pass equation. So you can say the the topic of the upstairs uh, F structure, Right, so if you are here, you say the topic of the upstairs F structure is identical with uh, the comp of the upstairs F structure and the object of comp, right? So comp option. So you identify this with this. Um, what you see on that slide, on this slide is a uh, much simpler example. So we don't have an embedded sentence, but uh, still we can front the object. So Chris we saw uh, is possible. And uh, the, um, the identification is just the topic value with the object and it's not below a comp, right? So it's just the object at the most outermost level. As a constraint, it would be topic uh, equals object. And this is even more fun. So um, we have uh, a really deep embedding. Chris, we think Anna claims that David saw. So we have that uh, and uh, that clause and uh, an embedded clause without the Z. So um, it's two comps, right? So this topic is identical to comp, comp, opt. And as a constraint, that would be topic uh, equals comp, comp, opt. Um, the, um, the, the constraint annotation can be done at the, uh, at the C structure and the rule would look like, would some, be something like that. CP goes to some XP and C bar. This is the head, so up equals down. And um, about this thing here in spec CP position, we would say, okay, the what is down here is the topic in the uh, mother F structure, right? And uh, this is a kind of constraint we discussed in the previous slide. What is the topic in the upstairs uh, F structure is also the comp op in the upstairs F structure, right? So we can say something about the F structure contributed by this thing. Uh, and 
there must be a complement uh, complement clause and an object inside the complement clause somewhere here. So that can be set at this place. But we already saw that it's not just this possible possibility, but it could be opsh, comp, comp, opsh, comp, comp, opsh, and so on, right? So it can be arbitrarily deep. And the trick that uh, LFG does is uh, that they use regular expressions. So they use the Kleene star here, um, and that stands for zero or one or two or three or four uh, repetitions of comp, right? So as, as many as you want. And uh, this trick is called functional uncertainty. So you don't exactly say uh, which things are equal in, in uh, F structures, but you say, oh, let's have a look uh, in that direction. And you say something about the path, so it has to be comp. Uh, all the way down, and then you find some object or in, in German uh, object, subject, or whatever. Um, uh, the, what we talked about now was fronted topics, but the fronted element can be a focus as well. So um, you can specify that using the junctions. Uh, that's this bar here, topic or focus. Uh, is uh, an arbitrary set of comp and then object. And you can use abbreviations for that. Uh, so topic or focus can be abbreviated as DF, discourse function. So then it's more compact and more readable. Okay, that can be done for, for German as well. The same technique. Um, so nothing uh, exciting in terms of difference between English and in German. Um, yeah, to sum up, LFG is unification based or constraint based and works with feature structures and phrase structure rules. Um, the grammatical functions are primitives in LFG. They are not uh, defined with reference to structure as in GB. Um, so they are, you, you find that in theoretical statements. Um, LFG is strongly lexicalized. Valence alternation like passivization are captured in the lexicon via lexical rules. And yeah, it, it aims to be psycholinguistically uh, adequate and uh, to be implementable. Okay, this is uh, it for LFG. The next series, uh, uh, the next session will be about category grammar. And yeah, stay tuned. Thanks for your attention.